Last month, we, we started this series of messages called uh, Making Great Decisions. And it is a controversial subject. Uh, we all know that, but I thought I should warn you that I got a fortune in my fortune cookie um, that said, your ideas will be totally acceptable. Just thought I should inform you. Now, we started with this thought, and we've had this up here pretty much, a little different form here. God is far more concerned with why you make a decision than He is with what decision you actually make and how you make it. And the reason for that is that if you get the why wrong, if you do things for the wrong reason, it spoils everything. We proposed using six questions that uh, might help to identify the, the why. And so on the front of your notes that you got are these six fork questions, things that you ask when you're at the f proverbial fork in the road. Uh, they relate to the reasons behind making one decision rather than another one. And as much as I love the wit and wisdom of uh, Hall of Fame theologian Yogi Berra, whom I quoted last week, his advice doesn't exactly help too much when he says, when you're at a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> well, you have to, I never knew what he meant by that, if it was actually, he found a fork in the road and, you know, he needed a fork and he took it, but whatever. Now, you have to settle the why of your life and its decisions first, starting with who you belong to and who you live for. And if it's not clear in your heart, uh, the answer to that question, like who made you and who bought you, uh, then uh, it really doesn't matter what decisions you make. It doesn't matter what school you go to. It doesn't matter where you work if you're not going to live it for Jesus Christ and do it for Him. It doesn't do any good to find the perfect marriage partner if you just are going to put them ahead of Christ. You're just creating an idol, and that's an abomination to God. Um, so there's no point trying to find the particular will of God, which is kind of what this series is about, until you have submitted to the awesome glory of God and His right to make all decisions. But once you have internalized the why of God, and this is where we ended last week, then you are ready to investigate the will of God. And so that's where we are. The next six questions have to do with the how of a decision on the way to the what. You know, so there's the why, and then there's the how, and then you're, eventually you want to get to the decision itself, which is the what. What have I decided? So at this point in the decision process, we're on the, the how part. How do you discern the what? That is, God's will for a decision. Um, what does God want? And that, of course, is a, is a very tough question. In fact, it uh, actually spawns several other tough questions. Think about Sarah, whom we met a couple of weeks ago. This is the gal, the high school gal that was thinking about going into medicine. She's very interested in that, but wondering about all of the costs and the demands of that and wondering how that would fit with and, and possibly make it difficult to get married and raise a family. And so she's churning over that. She wants to know, what does God want? And so how does she decide that? Now that she has, we hope, worked through all the issues of her motivations, um, knowing that she's going to live for Christ no matter what, knowing, knowing that she's going to uh, die to self and all of that, and she's got all of that clear. But at this point, the question still is not easy, and there are lots of questions. She might be thinking, uh, you know, what about prerequisites for knowing the will of God? Like, you know, not harboring sin in your life, and she's not feeling particularly holy. Or uh, having enough faith, she knows she's kind of a new Christian, you know, she, does she have enough faith to actually uh, discern what God would want? Uh, can someone really know that they're uh, what people call the, in the center of God's will? And if somebody feels like they have missed God's will, and this is a lot of pressure, um, then if they pursue the wrong direction, then are they a second-class Christian for the rest of their life once they've gotten off track? Or we might go in this direction. Is there even such a thing as God's individual will? Does God give you the freedom to make choices or are you required to get all your instructions from God, at least in things that we call major decisions? And then it probably should occur to her, uh, how, do you, how do you know which decisions are major and which ones are minor? Uh, that's a tough question. But, Sarah, think through it. How much actual freedom do you have to make choices? Maybe God just controls everything and, and it's just fate. Well, we venture into mysterious territory when we get into this question of God's will. And when we consult the Bible, our study is complicated by the fact that the will of God is used in two or three different ways. 
if you open to the middle of your notes, then you're going to have these laid out in three columns. So if you didn't get these, uh, there's some, I, I think I saw some back in the welcome desk. Make sure you have this so you can follow along. Um, there are three aspects to the will of God that we're going to look at, and uh, I'm going to survey them, all three of them, very briefly, and then we're going to come back to the first one and spend our day today on that. So the first one is the sovereign will of God. And uh, that's the one, that's one way that the term God's will is used in the Bible. And what it tells us that is that all of our decisions um, really are, um, well, they have to be done with humility. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Sovereign will, a humble decision. And that's the H of how. Hum, 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 humility, we say humble, but we don't say humility. Um, God's sovereign will is what even unbelievers refer to when they, maybe they've lost a playoff game and they hang their heads and they say, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be, or it wasn't in the cards, or que sera, sera. Um, and they know that God, if there is a God, that he has the ability to trump everything, even though it seems ludicrous that maybe he was really favoring one team over the other or cared that much about the ball game. But there's some intuition that if there's a creator God, that he's involved in everything, or at least he can be if he wants to. And so if God is cheering for a certain horse in the, in the Kentucky Derby, and so he's cheering on, you know, big time lucky boy, uh, you know, rascal baby, so some of the names are really funny, uh, then, the, you know, then the horse is going to win. God can do that. And so here's the sovereign will of God, his will of decree. Um, and this is the will of God that you can't miss. And why not? Because the Almighty God ordains things, and they come to pass, whether we like it or not. And whatever does come to pass is according to God's will, is sovereign choice. And that's why humility is mandatory on our part. Now we're going to come back to that. There's another will of God, and it's the one that you can miss, and it's the moral will of God. It's what God always wants in the moral sense, and therefore a great decision must be an obedient one. And that's the O of the how, obedient. Now, you can miss this will of God because you can disobey God. Uh, you can't disobey God's sovereign will. Now, if God tells you that his will is that you should always give thanks in all circumstances, which, of course, he does in First Thessalonians 5.18, we know that we have all missed that one. Uh, at least once or twice in our life, you can obey or disobey. But whether you obey or not, that command to give thanks is always God's moral desire for you. It doesn't change. And you ought to say yes to God's moral will, even if you don't have to. Now, when you're faced with a decision that has moral dimensions that are laid out, especially in the Bible, then the decision is settled. This is based on the authority of God that He has invested in His Word this reveals the will of God and it is binding on all God's people and all people in general. There's a third column in your notes, and we know that the Bible doesn't address every situation. I mean, it doesn't tell you where to go to college. It doesn't even tell you to go to college. And so when we're into decisions like that, we're dealing with things that are mostly non-moral or where both alternatives are, let's say, equally moral on their surface, on their face. And what's called for at this point in order to make a great decision is wisdom. And so then we have three parts to the how, H-O-W, humility, obedience, and wisdom, a wise decision. Now, God's moral will for all of us is the same, but when you get to this third aspect of God's will, the will of direction, then you have to ask whether or not God has some particular individual will for you that He expects you to discover so that you can follow it. And the question is, does God have particular directions? for your marriage partner, or for your career, your education, your ministry, your church, whatever it is? Does God have a wonderful plan for your individual life? And if so, how do you find it? Or do you need to? We're going to look at that in detail in a couple of weeks, for a couple of weeks, and believe me, that's going to require lots of wisdom. Now, I want you to go back with me to column number one, and this is the part of our study that we understand the least and always will, possibly, I don't know, and that, but that's why this part of decision-making calls for uh, this aspect of faith that we call humility. And the point of humility is that all decision-making, and in all decision-making, we must make 
room for the sovereignty of God. And I mean that total surrender to God, God's will above our own. And so it's like we're saying, Lord, you know, here's the room of my life. This is where I live, but you own it. And you have more right to live here than I do, so you arrange it anywhere you want to. That is your right. It all belongs to you because you made me and because you bought me with the blood of Christ. Now, when we talk about God's sovereign will, we should know that it applies to all decisions uh, that anyone ever makes. Now, some of you have come in today. I know some of you are going through tough things. And the study of the will of God is very personal. Uh, you have some, you've got some heavy decisions on your heart and mind. And they can get very complex. But one thing is so straightforward and so simple and yet very mysterious, and that is that God owns you and He has every rule, every right to rule, influence, and even overrule every decision that concerns you. We're talking about God's hidden control of all things. Um, And so that could make you a little bit nervous. You think, here, there's a being in this universe that can control everything, everything about me. Uh, And it would make me nervous if it weren't for the fact that God automatically has a wiser and kinder choice than we could even imagine. It's not something to be afraid of. If it's God's sovereign will, what does sovereign mean? It means that God is in charge, that God is the king, that God is the boss, and he happens to be benevolent, all-powerful, smart, creative, resourceful, and full of love. And he happens also to know the future. And so he's like no other boss you ever work for. He is, and this is the gospel truth. Before you even know what he wants, you have the privilege of recognizing God as for who he is and honoring him with a blank check. That's humility. And it's the only logical response to a being like this. Now, there's a vital principle that comes into play here, and this is a central point of Christian doctrine. God accomplishes all things according to the genius of his own profound plan for the ages. And for this, we check out Ephesians 1.11. Now, this verse is a small part of an incredible hymn to the, in praise of the sovereign God of salvation. And Paul uses this phrase to call attention to God's will in, the, in a sovereign sense. He, he praises God who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his own will. The word accomplishes is a word for for working or for effort. It's it's not that God stands by passively as people uh, and, you know, maybe demons run his universe and perhaps ruin it. No, he is working and his work gets done no matter what anyone else is doing. He's not attempting to do something. He is accomplishing. And he's following precisely a blueprint that he himself has drawn up. And so we would say that God is the great planner, but he is also the great builder because whatever he plans he completes. So, he has, we have the word from Paul, according to, and that means measured by or on the scale of or following the detailed specifications of what? Of his own will. This is his decision, his counsel. It's not our will. It's not the will of the devil. It's not anyone else but him. He rules the world. This is his blueprint, and he follows it. And how extensive is this plan and accomplishment? It says God accomplishes all things, all things, not a few things, not even most things, but everything that ever happens, that has ever happened and ever will happen. This is the sovereign will of God. Now, this is about God guiding and governing all lives and events, including yours and mine, our little lives. And it's what theologians are fond of calling providence. Uh, That is a noble word that um, tells us that God is guiding all of history and all of our lives so that they work out the way He has wisely and lovingly planned them. And this is what we call God's secret guidance through providence. This is God behind the scenes secretly guiding not just the lives and decisions of Christians, but the lives of all people, and not just some events, but all events, and not just people. It includes angels and animals and uh, weather and, you know, being born and dying and all of those things. He's controlling and ordering all things according to his own infinite wisdom and for the outcomes that matter to him. And that would chiefly involve the display of his glory and the coronation of Jesus Christ the Son with us in eternal adoration of him. Now, today I want to explain some simple truths 
from the Bible that help us understand this fairly mysterious doctrine. And it's basically in four words, four major facets of God's sovereign will. And so they're in your notes, the, His will is certain, it is comprehensive, it is concealed, and it is downright confusing. So let's start with certain. We'll go from what is, you know, more solid to what is very fuzzy at the end. Now, this is why we call this the will of decree. When you think of what God has done in life, in, in your life, uh, there are things He did decided to do that you can't thwart. It's just the way it is. And many of them happened even before you were born or in your birth. I mean, you didn't pick your parents. You can pick on your parents, but uh, you can't pick your parents. And the brothers and sisters were handed off to you without consulting you. And so, you know, here, have a poopy roommate. And then you have your birth order. How many of you are a middle child? Anybody? I'm a middle child. Uh, you didn't get to pick that, even though it is the most fabulous place to be in the family. <laughs> but that was not your choice. And then uh, how about um, where you were born? Born in the USA. That is no credit to your fine planning skills. Um, the century you were born in. Uh, let alone the very minute, that was not your choice, or the, even the continent, or, you know, whatever. So many things about you were completely in the hand of God. Your gender, your physical and mental capacities, a whole truckload of important things that were just handed to you without consulting you at all, from your toenails to your earlobes. And now, I want to go to some passages that show that God's will is certain like that, and it is for everybody. Just reflect on these briefly. We don't have time to treat these in detail. One of these is Daniel 4, verse 35. It says, but he, that's God, does what he wills. There is no one who can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Or read from Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And that is the verse that Lila Trotman quoted when she uh, heard that her husband had, been, had uh, drowned. Her husband was Dawson Trotman, who was the founder of that wonderful discipleship organization called the Navigators, mostly working with military guys. Uh, how many are familiar with Navigators? Uh, most of you. Well, anyway, Dawson Trotman started it. Uh, so here was an afternoon. Uh, Dawson had to plunge into the lake to try to rescue two girls, which he did, two girls that had been thrown from a speedboat. He saved the girls, but he himself lost his life. And a friend who was with him came running down the beach, and he, he was, and he found Lila. And he says, Lila, Dawson's gone. He just screamed it. And that's when Lila calmly quoted Psalm 115.3. Just took comfort in God's determined will. She just said, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And what seemed to be a premature and untimely death was another example of God getting his way in life and in death. Who can resist him? Here's how the great sufferer Job said it at the end of his course in the University of Adversity. At the very end of the book, he said this, I know you can do all things, he's speaking to God, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And that's Job saying, um, uh, God, whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. Uh, and I don't have answers. I don't pretend to have answers anymore, but I have you, and I embrace you as my sovereign master. Romans 9:19. Now, I apologize for not taking the time to lay out the context for all of these wonderful verses, but here Paul asks, who resists his will? And the subject in this section is God's freedom to choose who should be saved. And so he asks, who resists his will? And the answer is nobody. There is nothing that can prevent God's will from coming to pass. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. No, not my purpose, all my purpose. And so we learn that the sovereign will of God is as certain as He wants it to be. It is a matter of His innate power and His authority. God's sovereign will is also comprehensive. By that we mean that it covers everything from germs to galaxies. Uh, we already learned from Ephesians 1 that it, it covers all things. So we, should, we could build a list from the Scriptures about specific things that fall under His sovereignty. Uh, God, and I, I won't give you references for all these because we, it would take us a long time, but God determines whom Satan is free to test. That's Job 1. 
includes the outcome of business trips. It determines the decisions of rulers. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He can turn it any way he wants. God's will is in, uh, in charge of the sufferings of Christians. He determines who will be saved. Apart from his choice, no one even exists or gets born. God determines the time of our death and even the manner of our death. And then we have God's sovereign will in regard to the death and the resurrection of Jesus, even his betrayal by Judas, as Peter preached it in Acts chapter 4. All of these things were in the determined plan of God, all things, both good things and bad things. Job said it like this, shall we accept only good from God and not also adversity? Or in the words of God describing himself, Isaiah 45, 6 and 7, I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating a calamity, I am the Lord who does all these comprehensive control of the universe. Huh. I must admit it sometimes makes me a little nervous to read how much control God has. In it, I don't see any other way to read Scripture and be honest. It plainly says God's plan is not frustrated or altered even in the realm of disasters. Either that or isn't God. Now you might be thinking, okay, wait a minute. What do we do? What do we get to decide? You know, I was the one who, you know, chose my bride or my husband that I was going to marry. We planned out our little family with our three kids, and I don't think God did all that. I mean, it just doesn't seem that way. We, weren't we in charge? Are you telling us that God was doing something behind the scenes that we couldn't even see? Well, let me say, especially in the matter of who gets born, God has to be involved. You just think about it. How could he leave that up to chance encounters and random pregnancies? We know that God chose people in Christ before the foundation of the world by name, written down in a book. And therefore, no one gets born outside God's sovereign plan. So do you think that God leaves that up to some, you know, chance encounters and uh, flawed human beings just kind of tripping it up so that, you know, like your great-grandparents don't even get born because they never met? Um, you think God just leaves it up to us to find the right partner and make love at exactly the right time, and then by sheer chance, you know, the right sperm is going to swim to the egg, and then the little junior pops out in a few months and not little Jenny. Be sure that God is involved in a very big way. And how could God have chosen you for heaven and then not let you make it to earth? The exact you that he planned before he made anything. You've got to get born on earth before you can get to heaven. But wow, think of the intricate and mind-blowing details that providence must influence over the course of many centuries just to get one person born to the right parents with the right genes at the right time and right place. And it is staggering to think how much God actually controls to make that happen. Myriads of details just to fit together so that the right, your own parents somehow got together in the first place. And they were not necessarily believers seeking God's will, were they? And think of how hard it would be for you to be you if your great-great-grandparents never met, as I mentioned, just happened not to be on the same steamship coming from Poland. And that would seem like, you know, then your great-grandmother never would have been born, and that would have been really hard on you. <laughs> this was God's sovereign will, producing you. But we don't see God's working on the surface. It appears that we're the ones that make it all happen. That's because God's sovereign will is mostly concealed. It's hidden. It's secret. We don't see it. We have no idea what God is doing behind the scenes. Just to keep everything from blowing apart under the influence of human chaos and idiocy and a lot of demonic interference. Now, we can see it in past events. You want to know what the secret sovereign will of God was for August 3rd, 2019. You can read it in the news today. You find about find out about El Paso and the shooting yesterday. Um, we don't know how God ordains things like that, but He does. Anything God did not want to happen did not, and that's what we mean by a sovereign will. Now, if it's some event that's still in the future, of course, we can only guess what God has planned, unless, of course, it's something that God specifically promises or prophesies. Then we, we might know, but God doesn't guess. He knows the future because He has planned it. And by the way, the only thing that I can usually predict with perfect accuracy, so far anyway, is when Captain Kirk and the crew are about to beam down to a new planet. 
And if there are any crew members in the landing party that I never saw before, I know I will never see them again. <laughs> because they are the ones that managed to be get slaughtered and, and consumed. Anyone, but anyone want to tell us for sure what's going to happen this coming Tuesday? You say, oh, I've got a doctor's appointment. But you've got to wait till Tuesday. You don't know if your doctor's going to end up sicker than you are and you're going to cancel the appointment. You have to wait till Tuesday and then you'll know. But God knows right now. I admit to you that that is all beyond our puny minds. It's above our pay grade. We don't have these security clearance for anything that's secret. In spite of all we know about God and His sovereignty, His sovereign will is always confusing. And that's the fourth thing that we must say about God's providence. Paul said it like this, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways unfathomable. They're inscrutable. So Maybe we should stop trying to scrute them, you know. It's not hard to figure them out. It's impossible. They're unsearchable. And if God is in control of everything, that leaves us with so many other difficult riddles. For instance, if part of God's plan is to permit or plan evil, then how is He not guilty of evil? And yet He's the all-holy God. We wrestled with some of these issues not that long ago when we encountered how God uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart. I don't know if you remember that message, but if you weren't here for that, that's March 17 uh, from Exodus chapter 7 through 10, if you want to review on that. I'm not going to go into all of that. Hundreds of books have been written on this. Hundreds of sermons have been preached on it. We, in fact, have a few good answers, but there's always a, you know, this healthy sliver of mystery that we can't fully resolve. And so confusion. Now, someone said confusion is a word we invented for an order we don't yet understand. So I I believe we will understand. A time is coming when we will know what's going on and how it all fits together. But for now, we can't explain a lot of things. The summer before our first trip to Liberia, Ed Coffey lost his oldest son, Jackson. And Jackson um, dived into the treacherous uh, surf there in um, Monrovia, in Liberia, to rescue a pastor's son named uh, Romeo Pine, and he ended up losing his own life just like Dawson Trotman. Now, you might imagine that God sacrificed one person in order to save someone whose life would be even more significant. And it turns out Romeo was the guy that took care of my mundane needs while I, while I was there about six months later and, uh, in fact, slept across the doorway at night so that no one could get in and attack us. Yet a few short days after we left, Rebels came, invaded the compound, and they, um, they came in and they, they grabbed a bunch of, of the blind guys. Some of them actually came here eventually and, and sang in a beautiful blind, cho- blind guys choir. Amazing guys. But anyway, they had, the rebels had these, gu- these blind guys lie down in the sand, and then they couldn't see anything, and they were just firing off their weapons between them just to terrorize them. And Romeo had been put in charge of these guys, and he stood up bravely, and he said, and he, and he told the rebels to stop. And so they, they took Romeo, and they hacked him into pieces, and they left him dismembered there in the bloody sand. So what had become of the noble sacrifice of Jackson Coffee? As we sometimes say, God only knows. <laughs> to us, it's a complete misery, mystery and a complete misery. It almost feels like the gates of Hades are prevailing. Now, I'm not going to give you platitudes or anything else. We try to avoid simplistic answers around here, unless there happens to be one. And sometimes we would love if there was one, especially when events plunge us into serious heartache. But on this issue of God's complete sovereignty, even in times of tragedy, I'm on the same page with Vance Havner, who writes this. I get a little weary of those dear souls who have all the dealing and doing of providence cataloged and correlated and figured out and can give you glib little answers to your heartache. God just doesn't operate on our timetable, and some of his operations don't add up on our computers. The little boy who didn't understand why God put so many vitamins in spinach and didn't put more of them in ice cream had a pretty good idea that it just doesn't work out like you would think. Now, could we do a better job than God? Well, we can't even explain where the missing socks went during the spin cycle. I mean, there's no end of mystery. So you don't want to be in charge of the universe when you can't even figure out socks. 
but we don't understand how it all makes sense. We just don't want anyone else to be in charge but God. And at some point, we must learn to accept it, deal with it by faith, and start bowing down in worship. And now we want to talk about how to respond to this. And that's the very first thing. Bow down in amazed worship. We already looked at Romans 11.33, but we didn't read all of it. Because this is really worship. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Paul is full of awe, and it is his his delight to brag on such a God. Now, this was Paul, for crying out loud. He had been abused by life. He had suffered innocently uh, every manner of disaster for being a preacher of Christ, and he's the one that's talking like this? He's been clobbered by circumstances, and he could be thinking, man, if God can control everything, how do you get so mad at me? But no, Paul is the guy who formulated the most affirming take on providence ever written. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And then in Romans 8, he tells you what the purpose is, and that is that you would become conformed to the image of Christ, that is, you get to be like Christ. And so this is not a man who had an easy palace life, but he did know this, that whatever happened to him, no matter how blunt, how brutal, something that would make maybe the normal person curse God long ago. And he speaks of God's providence with adoration and admiration because he knows that all those things he goes through give him this amazing treasure that is to be like the Lord whom he loves. I believe it's impossible to have an accurate understanding of guidance without a robust doctrine of suffering. And that's what Paul had. (laughs) And so he bowed bloody and bowed. You know the poem Invictus has this frame, bloodied but unbowed, the prideful heart, but this is a humble man. And so his brow is bloody, but his knees are bowed. And this is the man that sings in jail. And so should we. If only for the amazing fact that God, full of holy power and total freedom to use it, let sinners like us live. And there is nothing holding back God's wrath from simply destroying our planet and us with it, except His free choice to extend grace by sending His Son and suffering our death so that He might reconcile us to Him as His friends. So fall at His feet in humility because it is only God's will, His sovereign will, that separates you from eternal hell this very moment. There's a second response to God's sovereign will, and that is to take a flexible stance in all your planning. In the notes, I add these little letters, DV. You might know what those stand for. DV, this is Latin, Deo Volit or Deo Volente. Latin for God willing. And we get this phrase directly from James chapter 4. James says this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live, that is, even be alive, and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil, sinful. Now, James is not blaming anyone for making plans. I mean, you can very well live without planning something, but... What's wrong is the arrogant attitude, because there's no respect here for the sovereign God who has every right to interrupt your great plans and do something else. So I make my plans, but I must add this little footnote, you know, the small print, to every plan, if God wills, DV, Dea Valente. This too is humility. But now there's one more response that we should have to God's sovereign will. And the third thing is that we should leave the interpretation of circumstances to God. Now, here's what we often do. Either either we try to read circumstances ahead of time in order to determine God's leading, or we read them after our decision to determine if we did the right thing. Uh, Both of these are foolish. Let me try to explain. I want to say something about open doors. Because that's one thing people, they talk about this when they're trying to figure out what God wants. You know, where's the open door? 
Now, it's easier to interpret closed doors <laughs> because, you know, you apply to a school that you chose and, and they don't admit you. So we just say that that must be God's will. That was easy. Or we ask a girl to marry us, and she says no. And that was her will. <laughs> So I want to say something about open doors. Now, if we look for an open door as a sign of God's will, we should check out 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. The passage sort of slams the door on open doors. We found out from Paul that an open door is not a signal from God that there's something that you're supposed to do. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was open for me in the Lord... Now, that seems sort of directive at the point. You think you're going to read the next verse, and it's going to describe how they went through the door and then amazing successes, successes that followed, but no. It says, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, that is, walking away from the open door, I went on to Macedonia, and then he went on to Corinth because he, he needed to know what was going on there before he could do anything else. And so evidently, an open door, which would mean a lot of favorable circumstances pointing in one direction, does not constitute a mandate from God to go through it. This is not God leading you. So that warns us how to, to be careful how we judge circumstances before a decision. And when I say circumstances, that is things God would have arranged in His sovereign will. But now we're also guilty of trying to read a decision afterwards by, you know, checking out how favorably the circumstances have gone, how they've worked out. And and usually then we're looking for confirmation that we, that we made the right decision, we're doing the right thing, we're in God's will. And so now let's say some bad things happen after you've made a decision. Well, I want to say this, that it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to reach the conclusion that all the bad things that happened to Paul were not some indication that he had gotten out of God's will by becoming an apostle and doing the apostolic work. No, obstacles tested his resolve, they developed his character, and... Uh, and even if it were you, you would have had the same trials. doesn't matter what decision you make because that's the way of life. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. Now, these are priceless. He says this, But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service is open to me. And now he defines an open door in a way we would never have thought of. Get this, he doesn't say but, he says and, there are many adversaries. And that's an important verse because I hear people nowadays virtually define an open door as the lack of adversaries or obstacles. So if you're in God's will, life is automatically smoother. Really? Not according to Paul. You can have an open door and everything could be going wrong. Hudson Taylor said famously, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Have you ever heard that? Beautiful statement. Now, it is a nice idea, and I admire Hudson Taylor very much, but that idea is not in the Bible. Paul often lived in poverty and had to learn contentment when he was suffering prolonged periods of need. And then, by the way, when I hear that, I can actually, I wonder if anyone can actually claim to ever be doing God's work completely in God's way ever. And then, how do you know what God has supplied and what blessing is? How do you know? When God is blessing something, it gets bigger, it gets smaller, it's easier, it's tougher. Aren't you amazed even that God blesses anything? And maybe we should be hesitant to pretend we know when God is blessing something or when He isn't. Humility again, because trials often could be God's greatest blessing to you. We need to finish by talking about the fork questions. And we're going to have two of them, the trust question and the trump question. Um, and we need to be able to answer these before we take the next step in our process of coming to a decision. Uh, we ask the first four questions, the ones on the front of your notes, to make sure that our motives are worthy of a believer. Now we want to see if we are making room for the sovereign will of God. And so let's say we're ready to make a decision, and here would be the first one, uh, and this is the trust question. Are you submitting to all, it all to God, all to God, in full trust for His ultimate will? This is humility in the form of dependence. The Lord has the freedom to get your feet into places you never dreamt you would go. He can close off things. He can open up things without ever consulting you. He doesn't owe you a vote. And so you just have to trust Him. 
T-R-U-S-T, trusting. Trust starts with all those unchangeable things that God ordained for you before you were born. And if you have mild to severe uh, issues with uh, acceptance, self-acceptance, that can deeply affect how you trust God. Because if you're thinking, you know, God didn't do well by me when he made me. Uh, you know, I hate my nose and a few other things about me. And, they're, and I've experienced some things, like in my childhood, that God could have prevented. Then how do you trust him with your future? It's time to bow your knee and humbly thank God for how he made you, things he allowed. He allowed nothing without great purpose. And you are part of God's inscrutable plan. God designed you and he loves you as he made you because he made you in the best way for you to be able to take on the character of Christ. Well, Job said it so eloquently, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I'll still hope in him. That's extreme trust. We had a series of serious phone calls starting on a Tuesday night, late through the night. A teen orphan girl whom, whom our family had sponsored and, and helped along since she was a little girl was in trouble. The previous fall, she had made some moral compromises that ended in a pregnancy. And she was, uh, she was profoundly ashamed, but she did not abort the baby. And so she gave birth to a little boy named the little guy Bruce Stabbert Flomo. He had a rough go for a while. He almost died. But he started pulling through, and then one of her friends said, you know, she should feed him some cereal because he needed to gain weight. And uh, uh, So, I mean, our girl didn't know, she didn't know anything, so she heated up some cereal. She heated up too much, and she fed it to the baby, and it scalded his throat, and some of it uh, went down his lungs, and uh, so early Wednesday, uh, the baby died in the hospital. Could not do much without a proper respirator. So now there's our girl who had been served a difficult life already, and now she's holding that little baby dead in her arms, overwhelmed by grief and by guilt. And some of the people around her are telling her God is punishing her. Sometimes I wish it were that easy to discern the mind of God, but we can't. There was a time to trust. And then the eighth for question. This is the Trump question. I know that's kind of funny, but think of it as the pres presidential veto. <laughs> anyway, the question goes like this. Do you welcome God's freedom to mess this up for the better? In other words, you invite God to trump anything you decide, knowing that any change that he will make will automatically be an improvement. Now, it's sort of like my kids. They used to ask me to uh, copy edit their reports and their papers, and somehow I got them thinking that, that uh, suggestions that I made were going to improve the paper. But you come to God as the one who actually will improve whatever you come up with. So you say to God, you know, I can only see so far. And you know where I'm going and where it appears that I need to be going with my life. And, and you see the big picture. And you know how this decision that I make will, will affect other things. You know, the ripple effect, the collateral damage or the collateral blessing in dozens and perhaps thousands of lives. And I don't see that. So you know what will bring you the greatest glory and the greatest help for other people. So trump my plan, please. I beg you. This is the meek audacity of faith. A Christian looks at the future and has hope, not because he's sure he will always make the perfect decision, because he's pretty sure he won't, but because God has guaranteed a blessed outcome for our life no matter what. And two things in particular, things that we can hope for. First of all, is that we're going to be in glory and we're going to be like Jesus. We will be with him forever and we will be like him forever. And that's some pretty amazing things. For that to happen, God will regularly and always trump anything that will stand in the way of either of those. I was going to call this message, uh, When Life is Not a Sunday School Picnic. <laughs> and where I want to go with that is that in the end, it's all going to be a banquet. Because what God has in mind is truly amazing. Sometimes we, my wife and I were just talking this morning about uh, like things that happened yesterday or the uh, tornadoes and things like that. They're always called acts of God. 
But why aren't acts of God the amazing things he does to bring us to glory? Those are the amazing and the most perfect and wonderful and audacious acts of God. And we can count all of this. So we say, Lord, please embellish this decision, improve on it, edit it, overrule it. Please, Lord, trump it. And I will be forever grateful because your way is best, even though right now I don't see how. C.S. Lewis said, the best is perhaps what we understand the least. Helen Roosevelt was tested on that very point. I told her story uh, somewhat recently, except for this last part. Now, Helen was a single medical missionary from England who served in Congo during the Mau Mau uprising. And this pure, gracious, gracious and godly, innocent servant of God was assaulted and then raped repeatedly and humiliated, hanging on to the Lord for dear life. While recovering from this horrible ordeal, Helen and the Lord grew closer and closer, closer than they've ever been. She wrote a statement in the form of a question being asked of her heart by the Lord, a question that every person needs to try to ask himself or herself when it seems like God is messing up their plan. Helen, can you thank me, your Savior, for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? Now, I've been, I've been through things, far lesser things, yet I don't know if I can honestly answer that yes. I want to know why. But I want to also be able to tell God, I'm trusting you, Lord, for everything, and I thank you for both good and evil, and I'm going to ask you to trump even what I think are my best plans. I'm okay. I'm okay to wait until heaven for that, to see any good from what you've allowed, but someday I'll see it when I'm finally home. And so perhaps we could end with the Abraham question. Question not of doubt, but of affirmation. When he was standing in the dark before the punishment of Sodom and was pleading for them, and he said this, in the presence of the Lord, will not the judge of the whole earth do right? And the answer to that question was clear to him. I wonder if it's clear to us. Your answer will display whether you are willing to bow before the Lord in humility. Even if he makes your life, you know, the fork in the road, the one that turns out to be a detour, and that ends up being the road for the rest of your life. You have to wonder how all this stuff about God's sovereign will will actually affect the decision that you're going to make, especially because we know it's a secret. And then how can it really govern the choice itself? Well, you know, maybe it can't. I don't know but it can totally transform the attitude. And the attitude that God has in mind for us is the attitude of the bended knee, the attitude of humility. And if I'm arrogant, that's a sin. God promises to resist the proud, no matter what my decision is. So I must start every decision, every decision with the attitude that is bigger than the decision, the attitude that says what Jesus said, lying on his face in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Let's pray. This is what every attempt at worship really involves, Lord, coming to you and saying your will be done, saying what you have done, we appreciate we thank you. What you will do, we anticipate as good and forever good for our, for our blessing. When we sing, we sing because it is your glory that we, we know is the purpose of all these things. And so in the midst of all the efforts at worship, we also carry our wounds and our miseries. And so we, in a sense, bleed before you, knowing you have healing for the troubled heart. You have hope for those of us that have run across into walls that seem to have impeded everything we ever dreamed. This, Lord, is your sovereign will that we recognize as good and right 
And with Paul, we say, how wonderful that you are who you are. Accept our worship in the name of Christ our Lord.